Yes, I can. Boys, that's the record. That downs. Okay. <laughs> we've had a great time in the subway system. Boy, we've got a lot of different people in New York City. And um, I was talking to Pastor beforehand, and he was pronouncing people's last names like it was nothing. And uh, I'm good with like Smith, Amen. Jones, Downs. I can do that one. But uh, there is a guy that came up to me and Brother Dan Secret today, and he said, Hello. Hey, I want prayer. Okay. My name is And I want you to say my name in prayer. And I was really hoping Dan was going to chime in. All right, let's pray. <laughs> but he looked at me and I said, hey, right before I pray, say that name one more time. And he said, whatever. And I said, here we go. And so I said his first name. I didn't even try the last name. I said his first name fast enough. I sort of peaked a little. And he was fine. And so God knew who I was praying for. But we've had a great time in the subway system. Uh, today we saw 28 people trust in Christ, which we praise God for. And the day before we saw 21. And so that's 49 total. And tomorrow is our last day. And we uh, go to about uh, 1.30 or so in the subway system tomorrow. And we're going to try to go some sightseeing and things like that. So please be in prayer for us. And thank you just for the opportunity to come, to open up your church, to let all of us uh, people from all over, really, as far as Texas and Pennsylvania and all different types in between. And uh, even Florida with a nice 49-hour drive up. I think there's some detours, I remember. But uh, thankful for letting us, letting us come back. Thank you, Pastor Rector Court. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you haven't, let's go ahead and stand up by respect of God's word. And we'll go ahead and get going tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. <laughs> And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're going to hone in on that thought found in verse number 14 that we said at the beginning, the love of Christ. That's the title of the message tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the opportunity to be here at the Heritage Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that we won't concentrate on what happened to us throughout the day, or we won't concentrate on what needs to happen later on today or later on this week, but for the next few minutes that we'll just concentrate on your word and your word alone. Lord, I pray that you be with me and that you fill with the Spirit's power, I pray. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may take your seat. As you look back at our text verse in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 14, the Bible says, The love of Christ constraineth us. Another way to say that word, constraineth us, is that the love of Christ should motivate us. It should motivate us to live for Him. And I can't help, as I've been in the subway system, telling people about Jesus Christ and going over and over and over again. Of all the things the Lord has done for us, the more I tell it, the more I get motivated to tell it more. I'm just overwhelmed that God's Son would come and die on the cross for me. I had a lady yesterday, and she said, you know what, I, I can't imagine Christ wanting to die for me. I'll... I need to, before I trust in Christ, I need to make sure I, I'm a little better. I said, well, you're not going to get much better. Let's go and trust in Christ now. And she said, that's a good point. I want to get saved. So she got saved. And we need, as God's people, be telling the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the more we think about all that Christ done for us, it motivates us to live for him more. When was the last time you told people about Jesus? Has it been a week? Has it been a couple of months? My friend, if you ask God to give you someone to tell Jesus Christ about, he will send someone your way Amen. if you're paying attention. Amen. What motivates you right now? It's so easy to, make, to get us motivated into different things that really aren't very spiritual. 
I get motivated about some things. I'm a human being, so there's some things that I like. Uh, I like cars. There's all different types of cars that there's no way possible, even in 20 years, I can afford here. Uh, there's Mercedes all over the place. And I think, whoa, that is awesome. I just watched 100 grand drive by. And uh, I thought, well, maybe in 30 years, I might be able to you know, rent that. That would be awesome. <laughs> And that, I get motivated looking at different cars, how people soup them up and do different things like that. I like that. I get motivated to see more cars once I see it. I get um, motivated about Apple products, not fruit. <laughs> that does not motivate me. But electronics, we were overseeing Trump Tower and all those different things. And then I saw it like a beacon in the night. There is an Apple store. And I thought, I need to tell these people about Jesus or something. I need to go over there and try to make this spiritual. I need to see it. So we got down and on the elevator. You know, I at least got to go up that elevator. That was really cool. And I saw all these different electronics and all these different things. I wanted to touch everything. I wanted to play everything. And uh, I need it. And when I see those kind of electronics, it motivates me. I need more electronics. So it's not good. I told my wife I was in there. She said, how long were you there? Uh, very quickly. Uh, because it motivates me that I want more of it. I like shoes. I sort of have a shoe fetish. It's terrible, isn't it? I'm just confessing things to you tonight. And um, last year, I was walking at uh, Rockefeller Plaza, and we saw this Cole Haan store. I know you're thinking, Matt, you're a preacher. Why did you even look at it? I don't know. Something's wrong with me. And I saw the shoes that I liked, and I had to get them. And I didn't. I mean, I walked out of that store because they were like $280. And uh, no, no shoes like that need to be on my feet or probably anybody else's. But when I see the shoes, it motivates me. I want to get as close as I can to those shoes. I like them. No doubt about it. We have all different types of things that we like that motivates us. But nothing more should motivate you than the love of Christ. Amen. 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 I remember when I first met my wife, we were the summer counselors at the Bill Rice Ranch in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And uh, I met her and I thought, you know what? I need to get to know her better. I was motivated. And I tried to do whatever I could to get her to smile. And if I could get her to smile every single day, I might have a shot. Those you've been there before? And uh, so I try to get to smile. I try to get her to laugh. I try to do anything that I could. We had a special banquet at the end of that summer, and I thought, this is my time. I'm going to ask her to do this thing. And uh, so I asked her, and she actually said yes. We found out that we were going to the same Bible college. That worked out really good. And I talked to her parents. We were able to date. And the next thing you know, we're falling in love. And then I needed to get engaged. And to get engaged, I had to talk to Daddy. And the love of April motivated me. I'm going to talk to Dad, no matter how scared I am. And so I took him out to eat. He knew what was coming. And he said, all right, let's go. And he ordered the most expensive steak on the menu. It was McDonald's. And uh, it was but no, it was a nice steakhouse. I was so nervous. I was so off my game. I thought, I don't know what I want. Just give me a chicken. <laughs> Food was delivered. Mr. Purcell started digging into his steak. I just stared at my chicken, and I said, sir, yeah, this is great. He kept eating. I need to ask you something. What's up? Can I marry your daughter? He said, sure, and he kept eating his steak. I didn't know it was going to be that easy. Well, I got the dad to say, yes, now I need to find the ring. Well. And our Bible college in the activities calendar had this guy that said he would sell diamond rings to Bible students for cheap. And I knew the kind of ring that April wanted and things, and it was actually a real diamond. And he, I called him up. The guy had a really weird accent, and he said, meet me at the Super 8 Hotel. <laughs> I'm like, this guy cannot be too much of a successful businessman if we're meeting at the Super 8, especially I knew the one that he was going to. So we got there, a buddy of mine went with me. I said, keep the truck running. We may have to run out of here pretty fast. <laughs> we got there, and he spreads out all these diamonds all across the bed. And he said, hey, Matt, which one do you want? I was like, all right. So I showed him a picture. He went through catalog after catalog and after catalog. On the last catalog, towards the last page, 
He said, I found the ring that you want. I went on a payment plan to pay off that ring. And did I mind? No, because the love of April motivated me. In Bible college, there's all these ways that people get engaged. And it's sort of a big thing. The girls would come back from Christmas break. Oh, this is how I got engaged. And I thought, oh, man, I got to figure something out. <laughs> My family comes from a long line of romantics. My grandpa was driving down the road, and as they're crossing a bridge, he looked over at my grandma, and he said, Marilyn! She said, yeah, marry me. She said, okay. <laughs> Kept driving down the road. My dad was driving down the road. Looked over at my mom, Christy darling. She said, yeah. He was a lot more romantic. Look in the glove compartment. <laughs> the ring fell out. Marry me. Okay. Kept driving down the road. So I thought, you know, I could put it, you know, in the seat or something. I don't know. I was trying to think of something big. Well, I was watching ESPN because guys get very romantic thoughts when they're watching ESPN. It helps us. And a commercial came on about this guy and the lady. They're running through the forest. And, oh, as they're running through the forest, the lights come on in this dark forest. And the guy drops on one knee and says, marry me. And they get married. And that's why you should buy this ring that's $5,000. And so I thought, that's what I'm going to do. So I went and asked my uncle. I said, can we do what this commercial said? And he said, uh, I really don't have a forest. I've got a cornfield. And I, I'm from Indiana, and I said, okay, that could work. And he said, I don't have any trees in it. It's, uh, you know, New Year's Eve. So i uh, tell you what, um, let's replant my Christmas tree. And he had a real life Christmas tree. I said, okay. So we replanted the Christmas tree, and he said, now we're going to string it with lights. We're going to get a park bench. We're going to put a generator underneath the park bench. And he rigged up a switch. So it would turn on, very romantic noises, you know, so I wouldn't have to pull it. So I said, sounds great. Well, I picked April up, you know, and I was going to get ready to go to our church for the watch night service on that New Year's Eve. And I said, April, I know you don't understand this being from Florida, but in Indiana, sometimes we go through cornfields for shortcuts. And I didn't lie there. That's true. And she said, okay, well, I'm with you, so whatever. So it was a very romantic drive. We started driving through the cornfield. You know, that's where we're going. <laughs> Everything was frozen over. And we went out there and had to sit down off the park bench. There was sparkling cider. There was Oreos, her favorite, double stuff. There was blankets because it was four degrees. <laughs> I flipped the switch, <laughs> the lights came on, and there was one ornament on that tree. And she said, oh, look, there's an ornament. I said, that's your ornament for Christmas. She said, oh, okay. I said, go get it. So she went and she got it. She goes, oh, it opens up. Yes, it does. <laughs> and I uh, dropped the one knee, asked her to marry me, and the first thing she said was, did you ask my dad? And I said, yes, and she said, yes, and wonderful story. Well, all that was no big deal to me because the love of April motivated me to do all those things. The love of Christ should motivate us as well. The love of Christ should motivate us to be saved. Look back at our text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and look at verse number 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. I love that verse. I'm so thankful that when my heart stops ticking, that you may see my shell here, but to be absent from this body is going to be present with the Lord. I'm not going to be floating around New York City. I'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that comforts me. Not only should... That comfort us, but also something scary about it is in verse number 11. Is because there's also a heaven, but there's also a hell. In verse number 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciousness. I met people today that said, I'm living in hell right now. This is hell. So you're sadly mistaken. 
if you think this is hell, hell is a whole lot worse. And the last thing that I want to see is the terror of God. But you're going to see it if you die without Jesus Christ. The love of Christ coming to earth and dying on the cross for our sins and raising from the dead should motivate us to be saved. Because, friend, there is a heaven and there's also a literal hell. But not only should it motivate us to be saved, but also should motivate us to serve. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Who are you living for? Has there been a time in your life that you've been saved? I hope so. Has there been a time in your life that you said, God, I am willing to do whatever you want me to do. Christian camping, you hear that heard two or three times every single week. And we said, that's what our teenagers need. They need to be sold out for Jesus Christ. There needs to be a time that you do that. And I know that, but there's so many adults that are not living that way. And we should lead the way in that. The love of Christ should constrain you, should motivate you to serve. I'm so thankful the love of Christ constrains us. Number two, I'm so thankful the love of Christ <laughs> conquers all. Turn your Bible over to Romans chapter number 8. Would you turn there, please? Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8, and take a look at verse number 35. The love of Christ conquers all. Romans 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sore? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm thankful the love of Christ does conquer all. It conquers attacks of Satan. The devil's after us. If you're going to say you're going to live for Jesus Christ, then he wants to depress you. He wants you to be discouraged. He wants you to be stressed out. He does not want you to live for God. We have an enemy, and he's trying to destroy us. Remember that. Remember the story of Job? If anybody's going through a hard time, it's Job. But always, anytime something happens to me, you don't know, get a flat tire or, you know, something doesn't go your way. You get an unexpected bill. It seems like the Lord always reminds me of Job. And you think, okay, well, it's not really that bad. <laughs> the devil attacked every area of Job's life. God said, do whatever you want, but you got to spare his life. So his seven sons and his three daughters were eating. Great wind came and roof fell upon them and they died. All ten kids. Can you imagine going through that? All your children dead. All ten. He kept living for God. He went after his family. He went after his finances. The Chaldeans came. The Sabaeans came. Stole all their animals. Except for the sheep. Well, at least I still got my sheep. Then you read on, a great fire fell from heaven and burned them up. That's a bad day. I don't know if that all happened at the same time. I don't know if they're like, well, at least we have sheep. <laughs> all right. What are we supposed to do now? He kept living for God. He went after his family. He went after his finances. He went after the way he felt. He had sores all over his body. His friends, they were a blessing, weren't they? They said, you know what, Job, you're not right with God. You need to get right with God. Job kept saying, I think I am right with God. Now, I just paraphrased like 40 chapters in the book of Job. I understand that. <laughs> His wife, she was a blessing, wasn't she? Her commentators say, that's why the devil kept her alive. Because he knew she wasn't going to be a hell. She said, Job, curse God and die. And he said, I'm going to keep living. For God Almighty. There's going to be attacks of Satan, but I'm telling you something tonight. The love of Christ conquers all. Mm -hmm. Not only does it help with attacks of Satan, but it also helps with addictions. 
The Bible says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. If you got an addiction tonight, God can help you with it. Sure can. I remember learning to drive. And uh, there's a guy named George that taught me how to drive. And George was a big guy. He was fit. He was about six foot four. Well known in our county as a basketball star. He married into a very successful business of gravel and things like that. So they had a lot of dirt roads. And so he went and told my mom, I'm going to teach your son how to drive. And I remember learning. I learned and found out that you're only supposed to drive with one foot. I mean, I thought it was pretty smooth with two feet, one on the gas, one on the brake. We're sort of going like this, you know. And uh, he taught me that only use one foot, use your right foot and different things. And I remember figuring it all out. But I remember watching George, big guy, athletic guy, had everything going for him, but he always carried around a cup. Every time I talked to him, he's always spitting in that cup. And I learned that he was chewing tobacco. Here is this guy that felt like he had all this success, but he was controlled by chewing tobacco. Always had to have his little cup with him. I don't think we had his cup with him. That would have been even more gross, but he always had it with him. Well, he started getting in some hard times. The business started not doing as well. And so instead of running to Christ to help with his addiction, he needed something more. And listen, friend, that's the way addictions work. You're going to keep on saying, I want more. And so he turned to alcohol. He started drinking alcohol. Then beer wasn't enough. He started going after liquor. That wasn't enough either. He started having different health problems and trying to help with his pain. And he started taking medicine. He was trying to find out ways on how to get more medicine. And he was addicted to these painkillers and things. He was a shell of a man that he was. Because he wasn't turning to Christ. He was turning to all the things that won't help him. Lots of weight got put on. He could barely move. Finally, one day, he told his wife, hey, let's go out to eat. His wife was really shocked that he wanted even to go outside because he hadn't gone outside for a while. And He said, go warm up the car. I'll be there in a minute. And she heard one gunshot. He killed himself because he wouldn't handle addictions the right way. Friend, the love of Christ can help you with that. It conquers all. The love of Christ should constrain you. The love of Christ conquers all. The love of Christ, last minute our time will be done, is contagious. Look at 1 John chapter number 3. First John chapter number three, would you find verse number 16? First John chapter three, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother hath need and shutteth up his vows of compassion from him, how to love the love of God in them. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The love of Christ is contagious. Did you know your attitude is contagious? New Yorker attitude. You meet people that are very friendly. You meet people that aren't so much. What kind of New Yorker are you? Or Texan are you? Or Pennsylvanian are you? Or Tennessean are you? Your attitude is contagious. Amen. I love Chick-fil-A. I was so excited that they moved a Chick-fil-A into Manhattan. I was so excited by this. <laughs> Chicken sandwich. Maybe people like it. Maybe people hate it. I don't know. But I love it. I thought, Chick-fil-A, sweet tea, Chick-fil-A sauce? That's what I'm talking about. So I had to find out a way to get over there. And uh, we got over there, and I had some questions about this Chick-fil-A. Because this doesn't happen in New York where people say, my pleasure. So I thought, I wonder, at this Chick-fil-A, they're going to say, my pleasure. If you go anywhere else in America, 
it's almost annoying how much Chick-fil-A people say my pleasure. And there's a guy at the ranch who used to work at Chick-fil-A, and I give him a hard time that he keeps saying it over and over and over and over again. My pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. Because it's just beat into the workers at Chick-fil-A. And I thought, I never heard a New Yorker say that. This is going to be exciting. So I asked for some things. Can I have some Chick-fil-A sauce? Now, it wasn't like down in the South, my pleasure. It was like this, my pleasure. <laughs> They're working on it. You know, it doesn't come very natural. And uh, I, I wanted a refill. Now, I know in some places, no, you don't do that. Yeah, we do refills, 250 You know, that's normally how it goes. And so I thought, I wonder if they'll do a refill for this sweet tea. And and uh, I said, hey, can I do you do refills here? I don't even know if you do or not. And my pleasure. <laughs> cool. So I got a refill. They said my pleasure. I was really shocked. It was great. We enjoyed it. And uh, they have a Chick-fil-A kind of attitude. Let me ask you something. Do you have a Christ-like attitude? Did you know a Christ-like attitude goes a long way? You should have a Christ-like attitude not only at church, I would hope that comes natural. But also in the subway, when pastor's not around, you should have a Christ-like attitude. In your home, you should have a Christ-like attitude. This is different. This is family. I don't, I don't see that in the Bible. We should have a Christ-like attitude everywhere. You know why? Because God's everywhere. And he hears how you talk, and he hears how you say things. We should have the right kind of attitude. It's contagious. No, also, your actions, how are they? How's your actions? Are they Christ-like? All these things are contagious. And the love of Christ helps with all that. So is the love of Christ motivating you today? Maybe you can see the areas in your life where you can get motivated to do a little bit better. But as I pray, why don't you tell the Lord that? And we start a new day tomorrow so you can be more Christ-like in your attitude and actions. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, we love you tonight. We thank you for this passage of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that the love of Christ will motivate us to live like you, like we should. Well, thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Pastor. Well, thank you for that challenging message about the love of Christ. So let's just sing one song about Christ's love, and we'll sing um, the love of the love of God. And that's number 130, number 130. Let's stand together as we sing number 130. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. And let's praise him.
And uh, we really, again, happy to have you. What we're going to do tonight is uh, take an offering. With this many people from out of town, we got to definitely take an offering. <laughs> uh, we we have a building fund in our church. We call it Project Rehoboth. Rehoboth comes from Genesis, where they kept stealing the wells from Isaac, and and he was uh, he said Rehoboth, the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So we call our our building fund Project Rehoboth. And so uh, I've asked our deacon, Adrian Smith, to come. He's going to just share a few words. But we did get a statement because uh, we have our, our uh, building funding in our various investments and things. We're almost up to $600,000. It's like $598,000. Well, we need like about a million and a half, so don't get too excited. But we're going to get in there. We're getting in there. So and last week, somebody did give us $13,000. and That was a real blessing. Uh, an individual gave that amount, and that's a great sacrifice, I know, for him and for any of us that would be. But uh, we're thankful for that and just wanted to, if you could partner with us, even if it's a dime or a penny, whatever you can get, we'd appreciate that. But Adrian's going to come and just share a few things. So, um, Pastor referred to uh, Genesis 26, um, where uh, the Project Rehoboth comes from and, and, and what our, our focus has been in praying for it. And one of the things that occurred um, in Genesis 26 and the reason uh, that Isaac had to move with his herds and his people and his herdsmen um, was that Abimelech said, you need to leave. And the reason I found that interesting as I've studied through this passage is that um, Heritage Baptist Church could be in that position at any moment. Um, our, uh, we rent a facility on Sunday mornings in order to have a space large enough for our congregation. And uh, last year, uh, about uh, um, 11, 12 months ago, the Supreme Court declined to take a case um, that was based on churches renting public schools here in the city. And as a result, uh, the Board of Education at any moment, if they so desired, could say, it is time for you to go. And so at that point, or in, in, as we were coming up on that uh, time frame, uh, our church has been praying about this and has had this project for many years. Um, but, but we have renewed um, fervor for our prayers that the Lord would answer in his timing, in his way, exactly the answer that he would give us on how we can have a place for our, our worship services uh, and to meet the, the needs of our ministry. If you're here in our ministry office, we... We rent this space. Um, as you can see, it gets a little uh, it gets a little full here um, when we have our services here. And there's twice a year that we have our um, Sunday morning services in this place, and we we do two different services, and it's a, a little bit awkward. One is uh, a, a Sunday in February where the the public school has a book fair, and so they use the location uh, that we would normally rent, and it's it's not available to us. The second is uh, a location. Um, that is right at the end of a parade route um, for the annual uh, Pride Parade here in New York City. Uh, and it's really not a family-friendly place for us to be. And so we utilize this place twice a year. But what we're praying for is that the Lord would provide um, a place here in the city that, that would give us rest as a congregation, uh, a place that we could open the doors at any time, have uh, a full church service, uh, and our people could come in uh, we could open the doors and have anyone, any visitor, um, anyone from the from Manhattan or beyond, uh, come in and be able to hear the Word of God preach, uh, be discipled, be uh, encouraged in the Word. And so that's what we've been praying through uh, for our project for Hobeth. Uh, and we're just asking this evening, uh, if if you would like, to to partner with us in prayer uh, for that. Uh, and if you would further like uh, to to 
you know, partner with us in giving as well. Um, we would appreciate that, but that is not required. But we would um, definitely seek your prayers. And so I'll pray this evening. Um, I've had my um, eldest son, Douglas, help us with uh, the offering in, in recent weeks. Uh, and I've actually asked uh, my second oldest son, Jacob, to help as well. So they will be passing down the aisle um, for the special music after, after I pray. So let's bow in prayer as we uh, take an offering this evening. Heavenly Father, I thank you, uh, Lord, for uh, this, this place here in Manhattan that we can gather. Uh, Lord, you have allowed us to rent this space. Uh, Lord, you have kept the doors open at the public school at this time for us to meet there. Uh, Lord, you know all the details, and Lord, you have uh, allowed them uh, to bring ultimate glory to yourself. Lord, we ask that in your perfect timing, that you would provide a place of rest for this congregation. Lord, that you would bring glory to yourself in a way that we could not take credit as man. But Lord, we could point to you, we could give praise to you, and show uh, that you are the Lord of all here on earth. Lord, we ask that as the funds are given this evening, that you would use them, uh, Lord, to further that cause. And Lord, that you would be ultimately glorified with all uh, actions of this uh, this church here in Manhattan. And Lord, that Heritage Baptist Church would continue to be uh, a place of, of worship for you. Lord, in the middle of this city, in the middle of all the things that go on around. Lord, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.